If you guys do not know this woman, you have got to know her. She is all over my TikTok whenever I open it up. So she's creating just giving, 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 giving. She's in here a lot. Um, I met her in the clubhouse space and she runs a co-runs a room um, called Recovered Life that is beautiful. They have amazing topics, just incredible topics throughout the week. So definitely hit that follow button on Christina. Um, she is just such a remarkable down to earth beautiful person. She's a coach, a speaker, a writer. Um, she's an expert in breaking codependent patterns. So just know that this is the place for you. If you know, um, I don't think I even was able to recognize my codependency for years into my sobriety. Like I didn't even realize how much I was doing that. Um, but Christina's here to share with you guys. She's a recovery and empowerment coach. With that, I will pass the mic over and um, definitely look above. She does have her sober, her recovered life community that is amazing. So join in. Community is important. We talked about that earlier with Polly. With that, I'll heed the mic over to Miss Christina. Please allow me or introduce yourself and let us know a little <laughs> bit about you. Wow. Thank you so much. Well, of course, I am Christina. And uh, Val, this has been an amazing experience, uh, what you've created here. I'm glad that you took the time to look at this, um, you know, this creative co-op of energy, I would be in tears too, um, because it's just beautiful to see how one, you know, something that comes to us that uh, people may think is, you know, it certainly presents its challenges, but it ends up being one of the most beautiful experiences of our lives and actually the gateway to up-leveling our life. It's, and that's certainly my experience and I just want to give a little background for me and kind of jump into what codependency means because uh, that is a recovery term, but it has certainly uh, taken over uh, so much of our world and descriptions. You know, I know like there's an attachment uh, room going on and uh, it is information that I believe whether or not you are in recovery uh, from a physical substance um, it is important to recognize these behavioral patterns and these, uh, these concentrated uh, kind of inability to take care of ourselves within relationships. And so my story is that I treated my codependency with alcohol. Um, I drank gobs and gobs of alcohol uh, because I didn't know how to take care of myself. And I was people pleasing myself to death. And so my first introduction to, wow, if I don't get my act together, I'm going to unalive myself was through the 12 steps um, for alcohol 25 years ago. And that was absolutely a life-saving moment. But uh, within a couple of years, I would even say a year and a half of recovery, um, I started a relationship with a, another addict and, um, like many addicts and many people in this world, that relationship defined me. And that introduced me to codependency recovery. And I'll give you a little history about this term because it's not necessary to label yourself a codependent, but it has its roots in recovery. Um, in the 80s, uh, the organization Alcoholics Anonymous created this term to describe the maladaptive behaviors of partners of people who were addicted to substance. And since then, um, it has grown and grown and grown. And, you know, a lot of people refer to it as people pleasing, which Val, I appreciate you putting that in the title because the one thing that I know, and I say this often in recovery circles, if you are an addict to a substance, then you are most definitely, uh, probably almost 99.5% a codependent but there are a lot of codependents that are not addicted to a substance. And so uh, the phrase was invented for that, but it has grown. And uh, we see a lot of treatment and um, work uh, in the recovery space, but also outside of the recovery space uh, to try to have these healthy boundaries. I, I run a room every week in uh, Recovered Life called Setting Healthy Boundaries because Really, that's the pain point that I think gets most of us into 
uh, at least looking at our behaviors and doing some of the trauma work. And so I'm going to give you kind of uh, the definition, the best definition I've ever come across. It's not mine. Um, I think Maria Weibrow uh, has this. Um, she's also a coach. I don't see her much often here, but uh, she has been here in the past. And, it's, and this is her definition. The short answer answer is behavior pattern of focusing on someone else's needs before our own. And the long answer is an excessive dependence on another person's approval for our sense of identity. And um, a lot of people think codependency means that you um, don't have uh, excellent self-esteem. And I think it couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, uh, maybe very low sense of worth, self-worth, but self-esteem can be very high in many codependents as it was with me. Um, I really ran my life and felt like this staple and the value that I presented to this world was based on me helping other people be happy. And, um, and maybe that doesn't sound like you, but as we go into some of the behavioral issues uh, it's really, really cool to start seeing that it shows up in all kinds of people. Um, I think a lot of women come forward first to address codependency, but it's absolutely, I have worked with many men um, and many leaders who have discovered that they have based their entire self-worth and productivity on the idea of how to help others um, first, that it's very important that they make sure that everybody's happy. And so I'm going to give you seven signs of codependency, um, which you can find on my website and through Recovered Life. Uh, but I want you to look at, um, just kind of think if this is your first time even hearing this term, or you've been around for a while, how many of these showed up in your life. So the first one is I find no satisfaction or happiness in life outside of doing things for the other person. I stay in relationships even if I'm aware that the other person does hurtful things to me. I would do anything to please and satisfy the other person no matter what the expense is to me. I feel constant anxiety about my relationships due to my desire to always make the other person happy. I use my time and energy to give the other person everything they ask for. I feel guilty about thinking about myself in the relationship and will not express any personal needs or desires. I ignore my own morals or conscience to do what the other person wants. And um, I think it's really important to understand that codependency is uh, something that we are taught. Um, a lot of us will think it's a personality trait or an inability to stand up for ourselves and we'll create a lot of shame about that behavior. Like, I know I should say no. I know I keep giving in. I know that, you know, I'm causing this because I'm not so good at my boundaries. And I think it's really important to understand that the roots of codependent relationship patterns are taught long before we can walk or talk. And so they're rooted in childhood trauma, whether it's a bunch of little t traumas, or if it's a complex trauma, which means it's happened over years, um, or uh, several big traumas. And, and it occurs when a child is made to feel responsible for their caregiver's feelings. And uh, what I mean is, uh, parents, immature parents, you know, or people that need help, obviously, will say something to the child or hold the child responsible for their happiness. You know, I'm happy if you're happy. The only thing that makes mother happy is if you're happy. Or they'll hold the, you know, and they'll hold the child responsible for their bad days too, or their pain. And it can be really extreme. Uh, one of the ways that it showed up in my life is that I had a, a mentally ill a caregiver who was not able to manage her own emotions and sadly never really got help until the end. And so she had all this love for me, but she couldn't control her mental illness and never got help for it. And so I would be very young, 
well, you know, uh, my the person I was raised with as a sibling, we were six and seven years old, and we were being taught at a very young age on how to pick the lock in the bathroom because my mother had herself locked in there threatening to kill herself. And it would become our responsibility to talk her out of it and to be as good as we could be so that she would remain happy. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that don't have those kinds of extremes, but they believe when they really peel back their belief systems, they start to realize that they never got the message that they were valuable just because they existed. Um, you're valuable because you do well. You're valuable because you're a good girl or a good boy. You're valuable because you're good at sports. You're valuable because you don't cause me problems. And um, we know traumatized parents uh, in the recovery space, we would call it adult children of alcoholics or dysfunctional families that were raised by people who were also traumatized. But what happens because we don't ever question these behaviors or the theory that our value is based on what we can do for others, we will work ourselves to death. We will um, manage everybody else's expectations in the best way possible um, so that we will feel safe. And uh, this week we had an incredible room about the trauma response called fawning, which is exactly, um, it exactly describes what codependent behaviors feel like. So if you walk into the room and you are a sensitive person and you know immediately that something is up and somebody else is hurting and your, your first instinct is to provide help, that's not a necessarily bad thing. But when it comes to providing help for others and not actually knowing what our worth is, we tend to get into relationships, work environments, uh, where uh, we will sing for our supper for the rest of our lives and you'll have a codependent crash. And so a lot of my work um, is based on undoing, uh, unwinding childhood trauma and on uh, figuring out new belief systems and daily uh, truths, you know, daily activities that let you know that it's okay to think about yourself. It's more than okay, it's actually your job. Because here's the, here's the little dirty secret about codependent relationships. I believed, I called them invisible contracts. I believed and attracted people that were attracted to somebody giving of themselves to a detriment. I believe that if I give you everything that you wanted and I made sure you were okay, that underneath it, you were going to do the same for me. And many people are attracted to, you know, wonderful people pleasing codependents like myself who are very happy to take but they never agreed to live their life for me. And so um, it, is, it is something that most of our relationships are based on. Um, you know, setting boundaries is an art and it takes a lot of time. And for many of us, we were raised in countries that are based on the dominator model. And so uh, there's a lot to look at for anybody who is deciding that they want to change their relationships in the trajectory of their life. They're feeling empty. They're feeling used up. They're resentful and angry because people keep showing up and taking advantage of them. And there is a, there's a side of it that's manipulative, but I know, one thing I know about recovering from codependency or, or arresting your codependent patterns, breaking them, is that if we come from a place of shame and black and white rigidity thinking, we suffer that much longer. And so I love to tell people, make sure that you find somebody who understands it, get with, get with a group of people, find support, a therapist, a coach, or all of the above, and start changing your activities to uh, match what you really want and having the support because it is our job on this earth, I believe wholeheartedly, to make ourselves happy 
first or to make ourselves healthy first and then give from a full cup. And then there are no strings attached to it. There's a wonderful saying in the Al-Anon program uh, that says for fun and for free. I only give for fun and for free. So it's not transactional or manipulative. And I want to close up because I want people to ask questions or share their experience. But I think that negotiating boundaries and defining boundaries when you come from a neurodiverse background, which I do, is even that much more tricky. Because, and I heard it in the last room, when we are labeled too much or we ask for too much, it is so easy for us to become codependent on top of the anxiety-ridden ADHD um, you know, brain where we are like, oh my God, I am not enough. And I've got to work, 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 work just to breathe this air. And maybe that sounds dramatic, but I believe that it can be. Uh, I believe we can get physically ill. We can turn to drugs and alcohol. We can turn to workaholism. And we can live these incredibly lonely lives where we are an actor for other people and feeling quite empty. And so with that, um, you know, anybody has questions, I'd love to turn it over to Polly and Val um, and just open this up because, you know, we learn from each other. And every time, whether I'm the one giving the speech or talking <laughs> or sharing, I learn something from every experience. So thank you to everyone who came in and are, and are here. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Val to do that wonderful moderating thing that she does so well. Oh, my and goodness. Christina, with a flash of mics, I mean, how much do you guys appreciate this? Your My experience of you, Christina, and always has been, is this warm, kind, nurturing, like almost like mothering, nurturing calmness that for someone like me who can be off the rails with my ADHD just is so peaceful and calming. And it almost feels like, like being home or, you know, eating milk and cookies with mom and knowing that everything's going to be okay. You know, it just, it's just that feeling that you bring is just such a beautiful experience. It's like a meditative comfort. And so thank you so much for opening your heart and for sharing with us some of those things of codependency. And, um, you know, I, I want to kind of go deep because I know I can with you. Um, I, know I know my audience well and I know that there is somebody in here who may be thinking you know um yeah with all these things going on maybe I have ADHD maybe I have um you know depression maybe I have alcoholism maybe I've been abused you know all these things going on and sometimes it just feels like what the hell is the point because it's been and I'm going to be really you know I'm going to go there with with everyone because I know with this audience we can and with Christina we can but it's like, what about that person that's like, but what? what's the point? This life has just been hell. I don't know what to do. I don't have anything that I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I'm contributing. I don't know what my purpose is right now. So I just, I don't, I just don't even know what the point is. Um, and they're recognizing some of that. So glad that you said that because we are worn out. We are threadbare by the time we get to this place. And um, I would say that I got to this place several times. I have a, a neurodiverse child who really needed a lot of help. And um, I mean, that is the Olympics of codependency when you have a nonverbal child and you have all of this codependency recover in your head, but your heart is breaking every day. And you think, what is the point? And some days that child was the point and what got me through. But this is what I can say. Um, to the person that is tired of working on themselves. I mean, I still get tired of working on myself. I still get the feelings, but we are feeling that trauma anyway. We're carrying it around and there is no end to the trauma unless you stop and process it. It will erode every area of our life. That's the hard truth. But here's the other side of that. Once we find that safe place, and I so appreciate your feedback, Val, because that's really important to me. Once we find that safe place, that safe person, or that safe group where we start practicing this, we get to take our lives back. We get to undo some of the 
belief systems that we have that the only reason why we're here is to work for other people or to make other people happy, we get to practice and get reintroduced to who we really were and are. Why we came to this earth is not to take care of others. We get to take care of others once we've taken care of ourselves. And I can tell you, after multiple engagements, because, you know, like I said, I'm a codependent and two divorces, that I live a life that every day I wake up, I know what I'm supposed to do. Now, many circumstances haven't changed. I still have a lot on my plate, but I also finally found the love I was looking for. And I am the love of my life. And when we are able to face the trauma, feel it, because that's part of the freeze response as a child, and we're able to feel it in a safe environment, very trauma informed with somebody, we don't have to carry it around. And I, I can say this with true certainty because I've been in recovery 25 years and I've been working on this codependency thing for 23 plus that I have the life I never thought I deserved. And I have the friendships and the community that I always wanted and needed. And now I get to go out and have these connections with people and they see me, they know me. They, they actually know me and um, you get out of the convincing game and to really know that you are worthy because you woke up, that allows us to get into that gratitude and that place of joy and that childlike wonderment. You know, I'm, I've met people on the way who didn't feel overly responsible and I would look at them like they were a science experiment, like, huh. You just said no like that, no problem. And now I'm kind of one of those people. I always want to do it in a kind way. I always want to be gracious because that's my value system. But I've worked with over a thousand people at this point where they've been able to have the life that they never even thought they deserved. They couldn't even imagine how good it is now. And so I just tell everybody, the quickest way is through, but you do it at your pace. Your life will get immediately better when you start learning some of these um, simple techniques about, you know, managing and having your first boundary be about self-love and taking care of yourself every day. And it'll grow and it'll grow and it'll grow. And that love that you were looking for, that I was looking for in my mom and dad, the people who should have given me it, I give it to me. And it sounds corny, and I would have rolled my eyes at it, uh, at it, you know, even 20 years ago. Even five years into recovery, I would have been like, that's bullshit. But I, I live it, so I have to say that it's worth it. Everybody has a place in this earth. Everybody has a mission. And I think that is our responsibility to come and be who we were supposed to be. Woo! Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And I know that there are people that will have questions, comments. Um, so yeah, flash your mic if you have a question for Christina or if you'd like to comment or share, we'll go ahead and open up the mic. So Brian, go ahead. Yeah. Um, hey, Brian. Hey, Christina. Happy to see you. Uh, yeah, happy to see you too. Uh, yeah, I, um, I just wanted to once again... Uh, say um thank you uh for your support uh back in the winter um uh, christina and i met in a space last winter uh when i was uh at a little bit of a uh low point on clubhouse as i had uh stepped away uh temporarily from one of the first clubs i joined in the spring of 2021 and um and i was having some issues with the host of that club and uh, that i did eventually return to the club until the club stopped having clubhouse rooms uh last spring um but uh i, I never forgot and i know that um, a lot of times i'm at work when christina 
when you are hosting your rooms on here. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I just appreciate you so much. And, you know, and she, uh, you were able to relate to me, uh, because of myself having autism, one of your children having autism and, um, and it was just a blessing. Uh, so, you know, uh, so that's really, uh, what I wanted to add and, and, uh, like, like Val, I, I am not always on, uh, TikTok all the time. Uh, I mean, I do post consistently on there, but I'm more likely to see stuff on Instagram than I am on TikTok. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, um, not, not to promote myself, but like, I, I do a lot of, um, videos as many people know these days and and um i've really found my niche with uh doing the videos about uh autism it seems to be what a lot of people respond to uh, or at least the people that i want uh to to reach respond to it so uh so yeah not really so much about codependency and people pleasing although i do feel like a victim sometimes of, of pleasing everybody. But, um, you know, I, I understand that I can't please everyone and I'm learning to accept that more, uh, if a social situation doesn't go my way. Um, and I've even accepted that, w uh, within my immediate family about certain things with me as it relates to the usage of my phone the way I connect with people through social media, um, or how I take it to real life. Um, still have a lot of steps to go with that, but, um, uh, yeah, I just work at it every day, uh, because, you know, these platforms are great, but it's even greater when you face to face with people. So, uh, so yeah, I, I use it as a tool. So that's basically what I'm saying is, it's a tool uh, to greater things and greater communities. So uh, thank you for listening and, uh, and sending love to uh, all of you. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. I remember that day and I am over here cheering you on. I see the stuff you're putting out and I do believe actually you are breaking codependent patterns um, in such a brave way. To be ourselves online um, is, you know, it takes courage for every one of us. And so, uh, yeah, you, you still have a fan in me. So thanks for coming in and saying those words. But I got my eye on you and I watch your stuff and everybody should follow Brian because he's pretty spectacular. Thank you again, Christina. And I don't recall if you had followed me on Instagram specifically, but uh, but I know I put my stuff on Facebook. Yeah, and I see you too. on TikTok. That tends to be where I'm hanging out right now because it's fun. Whoop, whoop. So awesome. I love the love in here today. I love it. All right. If anyone else would like to share, please flash your mic so we know. Okay, Polly, go ahead. Polly. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Christina, uh, for sharing that information. You know, I've met you probably about a year ago uh, and been in, had the honor of being in rooms with you, had many honors of listening to the rooms. And I still took a half a page, three quarters of a page of notes with all this valuable information that you were giving us today. You know, I, I agree. I came back from a, a really good family, right? In that sense, there was no, didn't seem like there was any emotional or physical or any kind of abuse. But yet I ended up in, with uh, very serious codependent uh, behavior systems that led me into uh, some really bad relationships. But I, if you could expand maybe a little bit more on trauma you know, and how a trauma, because I think we're learning so much more how trauma 
uh, especially early trauma, childhood trauma, and how blood then goes to the brain, activates that area of the brain. So then the brain, that part of the brain grows more and, and that part of the brain really wants to be stimulated more. Uh, right. and, and how maybe that uh, could or does, you know, keep in, educating me, man, because I'm loving this about trauma and codependency. Please. Oh, you get, you're getting to the part that I love as well. Um, so we, we know uh, it has been proven that trauma changes our DNA. And so epigenetics show that, uh, that we actually have changed DNA for seven generations prior. And so when you look at whether it's alcoholism, um, whether it is the development of a, a newer type of brain, like we call neurodiversity, for whatever reason, we are adapting to things that have happened to us and things that have happened to my, our grandparents and their grandparents. And so first, I'm so happy that you talked about, you know, your family of origin story, perhaps not having any trauma, but it has been proven it is proven both in alcoholism as well as anxiety that the body keeps the score. And so trauma, the definition of trauma is any time in which you don't feel safe, okay? And complex trauma is uh, not feeling safe over and over and over again for a couple of, you know, for many years, right? And that's why even though we didn't necessarily get abused. Some things happened at that time, or we have the genetic disposition that changes how we carry trauma and how we react to it. And um, I, I think it's so important for anybody who maybe is a little uncertain about whether they have trauma to uh, really talk to somebody who's trauma informed, which means they're not gonna cause you more trauma but also to consider some of the literature that is out there. The Body Keeps the Score is probably the most dramatic one um, because it really is one of the largest studies through Kaiser Permanente where they saw um, disease um, as well as mental injury, which is what I would call it, not necessarily mental illness. I think sometimes we have injuries and that's what happens um, to neurodiversity and they really show us how much it shows up in our body. And so uh, a lot of people think that going and looking at inner child work is about blaming our caregivers. And it so is not. There are plenty of people that need to, you know, look at their inner child and do some of the work. Um, and so trauma in today's world shows up, uh, it is defined by when I, Act, like if I'm triggered for something, when I act like a child, it, it, even though I'm an adult. And so that kind of looks like, a, uh, you know, I know in my brain this person loves me, but they didn't say hello to me. And all of a sudden I am triggered. My nervous system's off the charts. And I'm telling myself, this is ridiculous because you know that they love you. You know that it's not a big deal. Or somebody says something about me and I don't even know them. So it has no actual effect on my life. But inside, it's all I remember. You know, uh, we hear a lot of times there could be a thousand good comments, but one bad comment can take me out. That is unhealed trauma that is shooting to the roots. And it doesn't matter if it's as traumatic as the next person. It's that belief system that's, that both our genetics are informing as well as our experiences that we are not safe. If you are, one of the ways that I know I still have trauma that needs to be sifted through um, and I know how to deal with it in, in the day, you know, when a trigger happens, I know how to heal my nervous system and I work on that outside. That's that whole pre-work where we're responsible for ourselves. But when it happens, it's telling me, oh, okay, I, I have something that still needs to be looked at. 
I have something. And it, and it might look like, um, you know, I think recently I've been sharing about how everything is going the way it needs to. I mean, I've been sober 25 years. I'm in a very happy marriage. My son is doing pretty well. You know, we recently just celebrated a victory in that area that was really troubling me. But I'm still walking around feeling like I'm going to get in trouble. I know that's childhood trauma. And it's not necessarily childhood trauma because my caregivers got me in trouble. It's what it means is that I am reacting to something as if I'm still a child, right? And I haven't grown up and realized I can't get in trouble anymore. And, um, and it's even more infuriating when you don't have certain traumatic events to point to and say, wow, that's where I learned this. But Knowing that we need to investigate and discover and we need to do the nervous system healing and we need to have support around that and we need to grow our self-worth based on being alive and not the actions is kind of the formula. I hope that answered some, you know, what you asked. I'm not exactly sure because I went around it the long way. <laughs> No, thank you very, very much. You were so informative. Uh, it makes me want to dive into it even deeper, which I know we will have time to do in future rooms. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So good. Yes. Thank you for um, being willing to dive deeper into that. And then, Polly, thank you for the question, too. You know, sometimes those questions are what other people are thinking and they want to, you know, share as well. And um, so I love that you went there and I'm going to pass the mic over to Sally. Christina, thank you so much. You just, um, boy, I tell you, this whole morning, this whole thing has just been wonderful, but this hair has just touched me so much. And I'm just looking at it going, wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You mentioned nervous system healing that you need to do. Could you maybe expand on that just a little bit more? So, um, you know, maybe I can find ways that I can do research on that to be sure. able to. to yeah, do that. I would love the two. And, and I'll tell you, I came by this, uh, this information by necessity because my son, my son's nervous system was, you know, shot. Uh, and there are many reasons why that happened, but I had to learn because I needed to figure out how to help him. And so there are lots of different ways. I think one of the most action oriented uh, information that you can get in a book is called polyvagal exercises. So the vagus nerve is goes through our heart. And so when we are, are abs we are triggered, our nervous system is in fight or flight, um, which is really what we'll know. Freeze and fawn, you know, if we start realizing, oh my gosh, I've got to go take care of these people and I'm going to get in trouble, we can do some of those exercises. You know, my favorite one is putting an ice pack on my chest because it allows me to enter into the body. Um, we did a study in Rewire Your Brain, which is the other room that um, I usually show up in. And, um, and it talked about, you know, stress is normal in our lives. Uh, it, in fact, it's important. It's necessary. It helps us. And with ADHD, ADHD and the, the fact that your brains are dopamine deficient, it may be really important. It's the accumulative stress that ends up killing us and making us sick. So there are things that we can do um, to address the accumulative stress. So your body, your autonomic nervous system is made to make you run, right? It sees a threat. Um, it's, it's an old nervous system. It hasn't changed that much, even though our brains have changed a lot. And so it says danger. And the autonomic nervous system is automatic that you can't tell yourself, I'm not going to feel like I have to run for my life. Um, but it's triggered in situations in which we aren't gonna run for our life. And in that fight or flight, uh, it's it, it comes in and it goes out of us, right? You know, we either get it out while we're fighting or we get it out while we're running. But now we have triggers and now we have lives that it's not appropriate to run out of the boardroom if you're triggered. <laughs> it's not appropriate to start a street fight. And so we pause that, we freeze it, 
right? And then later on, it just keeps adding up and adding up. So there are all kinds of things that we can do for our nervous system and our body that will help us dispense of that fight or flight um, mechanism. And when you're in fight or flight or you're in freeze, your digestive system isn't working, your, your, uh, your access to your prefrontal cortex isn't working, there's all kinds of things. And it's that long-term uh, station staying there that causes us to even be more triggerable, you know, and more easily, uh, ang- you know, anxiety is something that if you have anxiety for six months or longer, you are uh, diagnosable as general anxiety disorder. But, you know, every once in a while, anxiety is a, a positive you know, it helps us to pay attention. And so a lot of us, when we're doing the nervous system work, we will study the brain and we will believe I am safe. I remember telling people this. I remember telling myself, I am safe. I am safe where I am. That was then, this is now. But if I don't finish it with the nervous system action, if I don't finish it with with getting rid of that energy, that cortisol, then it doesn't matter because my body needs to be triggered that I'm safe. And so exercise, of course, is the number one. Uh, Meditation, those polyvagal uh, exercises are awesome. And you can look them up on any book. I've got one on my shelf that's the 50 top polyvagal exercises. EMDR to help rewire that trauma that's too dangerous to go around. breathing exercises. Like I said, the ice pack on the chest is so helpful for me. It really helps me get there. And the physiological response of anxiety is the same as excitement. So sometimes with my nervous system, I can get really excited about something and it teeters over into anxiety before I know it. But if I counteract it every day with doing serotonin and oxytocin producing activities, I am repairing it. And so um, I will go out. I have, I have a system now that, it's, that I'm disciplined in. This is what I mean about the pre-work. Where in between clients and rooms, I go outside. I happen to live in Southern California. I go out barefoot and I put my feet in the ground. Because grounding is a wonderful way. I meditate for 10 minutes. I exercise every day, but you don't have to exercise, you know, we're not talking like, uh, oh, what's the thing that people do when they turn over tires, and you know, they're really strong. Uh, We're not talking about that. Just walking for 11 minutes can help. Uh, Music is always very helpful. Going out in public and doing kind of a a acknowledgement, just, just going out and buying a cup of coffee, talking to people that we're not even close to, notifies, notifies our nervous system that we're okay and the world is safe. Uh, there's also, if you can just remember a time that you laughed so hard that you almost peed your pants, you don't have to laugh that hard. You just have to remember that all of this helps our nervous system to repair. Thank you so much. That's um, that's wonderful. A lot of the things you were talking about are also the the things I've learned in being yep. mindful. And when I had my breakdown, I really contribute mindfulness to being what helped me to get to survive, to get my brain back to where I was able to function and be where I want to be. And once again, I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you, all of you people on here who you take the time and the energy to help other people's lives be better. I I just respect you so much for that. And Valerie, I call her Valerie. Nobody ever knows who I'm talking about because she's Val. But um, she's Valerie to me. And um, I am just so appreciative that, you know, you're doing this and that you're bringing all these people together. And um, thank you so much again for inviting me to be a part of it. Okay. Sally, I want to I want to say something about what you said because it was so imperative. Um, I like to think of a polyvagal exercise as triage. You know, so I'm in it right now. This is what I need to do to give myself that indication. But you are so right; it does uh, absolutely correlate with mindfulness. And I think of mindfulness exercises as like physical therapy. And uh, both are incredibly helpful.
Beautiful. Thank you so much for that, Christina. And thank you, mom, for that too. You melt my heart. And you know, something you were talking about with that um, nervous system, and I, I know this is a controversial topic, so I'll just stick to the point, is that I've been doing chiropractic care lately, and he showed me where the nervous system touches the spine. And with certain things, I was in an accident back in 2010, and um, there's certain things that do, you know, can trigger that, that with my nervous system. And I don't know, you know, I'm not a science, I didn't, t scientist, I didn't go to school for a long time to know this, but all I know is that the very first adjustment I had this time, I had this release. I mean, it was nuts. It was just this emotional release and I just cried. And yes, I'm almost 40, but I called my mom like 15,000 times in a row and was just like, I'm just so sad. And it was just this emotional release that I think was just like it had been building up. And you know, something especially for, because I know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs and um, very driven people in this room, is that we can get this adrenal fatigue where because we can live on a constant state of stress. I mean, I even just now, as we were talking about this, I realized that I am almost always in like kind of a tense mode. And, you know, this constant state of stress and worry over time, like Christina said, I just want to repeat it so that we can hear this, can create so much. And I love that you were, you used the word deterioration. Because, you know, there's, this is very real, you know, burnout, constant stress. And so taking the time and taking the moments to breathe, to slow down, especially if you know that you tend to sway on the side of nervousness a lot. You know, if you, you find yourself fidgeting with your hands or being tense or being tight, just be aware of that, you know, and, and, and lean into some of these things that Christina's talking about, because, you know, that type of like adrenal fatigue is a lot of that comes from drinking too much caffeine, being constantly stressed. Um, a lot of times if we have, you know, children that have mental or, you know, special abilities, if we have businesses, I mean, there's so much that can go into it. And so our nervous systems really do play so much into what we are, what we experience. Uh, I love that you shared that Val, because ADHD can, um, you know, when it presents, cause there's seven types and when it presents, in a hyperactivity thing, people don't realize that that you're very sensitive, incredibly sensitive. And we shared about it this morning. I do believe neurodiversity is a superpower and our brain is evolving and we are getting scientific information that is uh, absolutely confirming and affirming some of the metaphysical beliefs. Um, and what you said about, you know, touching that spot and having that release yes another thing that i i didn't bring up about the nervous systems with somatic therapy uh, emdr there are so many ways to help uh, don't give up um, if you have that try all of these things chiropractic i do a lot of myofascist release which has had that and the person happens to be a reiki practitioner too and she is literally pulling trauma out of my body and i can feel it burning and that is so true um and so i wanted to put up uh, a new link because i realized uh, that i read from the codependency quiz there's a free introductory program on this website that you can go read about all the things that I'm talking about, as well as the 35 questionnaire that kind of helps you start figuring out, you know, where codependency may have shown up in your relationships, where did it come from? And it's absolutely um, for free. And I just want people to, I spent about a year putting it together. And I want it out there for everybody. So if you hit the website, you uh, can go to offerings or, or go ahead and hit the codependency quiz, which was the one that I read, and you will get all kinds of information about nervous systems and relationships. And um, I, I have more time, Val, so uh, please feel free to continue to the room. I'll stay here as long as anybody finds value. I do have a question. Perfect. Oh, go ahead. I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity in that, Christina. I know I'm going to hop over there. I'm sure a lot of people will hop over to get that guide. And then with that, I'll pass to Christine. Or I'm sorry, Catherine. Okay. Well, I was just going to ask Christine, 
on the recovered life is that a podcast Ooh. and you're working another coach yeah, recovered life is actually um uh, a, a community and i thought so and yes yes you know get on the mailing list we are launching something I in am. the next 60 days uh, that will, I think, really open up the recovery space. I'm looking for people that both want to be involved uh, with, you know, educational purposes and coaching, as well as people that just want that extra addition uh, to their self-care program. So absolutely jump on that. Um, absolutely. You can just DM and me my... if you have an interest. Absolutely, because I think I was invited about a week ago to talk, or a week and a half ago, I had such a great time and I believe it was on his podcast, but I don't remember his name. Well, that would be Damon. Yes. Damon. I yes. Saw you and there. I apologize. <laughs> oh, no, I just, uh, I had a great time and um, I just, I'd never done that before. You did great. It, it was, thanks. It was, it was a wonderful time. And yes, I would like to get, get more involved. Uh, it's a wonderful community. Thank you. Um, Christina, if you don't mind, I just have a quick question. I wasn't able to, to hear everything, but you brought up a study from Kaiser, right? Um, it's the one from the body keeps the score. Some okay, other data it, came from that. Okay, but the data came from Kaiser. That was one of the largest uh, studies that they did. Yes. Got it. So, so I want to be very careful with how I asked the question. I'm assuming you trust the validity of that study. And the reason I'm asking is because um, in my experience, Kaiser hasn't always been at the forefront when it comes to neurodiversity specifically. Uh, I'm just curious if there's a disconnect sure. between the research that they're doing and then what they're actually practicing, which Absolutely. I know you can answer. Absolutely. Well, I can tell you the source in regards to the book. It was actually based on the epigenetics of trauma, and it did not necessarily um, go into neurodiversity. I tend to believe that neurodiversity uh, has a place when we're talking about ADHD because I believe that there is a lot of trauma in neurodiversity. Um, I, I work with a lot of neurodiverse people that suffer trauma um, because they aren't accepted um, or, the, or they're trying to live their life through a neurotypical you know, system. Um, I also believe this about empaths and codependence. And so uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't speak to no um, outside of that. It was one of very, very many studies that were cited in that book. And I very much trust, um, oh, I forgot how to say his name. I never say it right. Who has the body keeps the score on their desk? I'm oh, for it. Van, B Van Berleek? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, he is uh, is a very, um, I trust his his uh, interpretation. Um, but uh, the reason why I brought it up is because it was the largest to date on child abuse. Understood completely. And, and I sincerely apologize. That, that wasn't an indictment. No, I love you. your brain. Just, um, that's the way that my curiosity kind of uh, came across and the delineation between ADHD and neurodiversity and all that kind of stuff. No, it definitely rings. So I, I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, being open to the response on what was essentially a very finite detail in the entire scheme of your conversation. What's so important to know, and and I think that uh, that it's always important to clarify and ask because you brought up something that's very true in our data, uh, being a mom of a, a neurodivergent child, uh, being in situations where they don't want to provide services based on some study, it is frustrating. And a lot of studies are funded um, by uh, groups that do not have the interest of a cure or, uh, you know, uh, better practices at heart. Um, and so I, I have a specific, uh, you know, happy feeling to answer your question because I think it's really important for us to look at all the information that's being brought to us and make our individual choice that's based on us, period. Uh, Bessel van der Klopp. Thank you. And he has just written a second <laughs> book. 
um, that I haven't picked up. I've, I've read that book a couple of times. It is a, um, it can be very triggering. So make sure you're, you have a support system around you to read it uh, with, or a therapist or a coach or a group of people that can, can stay with you. Because some of the stories in that book, the individual case studies are, are very powerful. And, um, and uh, I did it uh, with a group of people. I wasn't the leader, but we did a book study on it on this app and it was powerful. And that was the feedback I got from a lot of people who came in and shared that it hurt their hearts. I wanna make sure I say that time too. Thank you guys. And actually, I always appreciate a little bit of controversy and I love that Dan, you are willing to speak up because it's like anything, you know, you really need to um, do the research, do your due diligence for yourself too. Because, you know, I always try and say that if something works for me, it may or may not work for you. However, the experience, when you have a lot of evidence behind it, it might, you know, so definitely, you know, it, with anything, do your due diligence, feel what feels right for you and go with it. You know, um, having leeches all over your body could be good for somebody or like one of those float tanks could be working for somebody and maybe that's not my beat but you know maybe yoga works for you and it doesn't for me and you know vice versa whatever you know really do your due diligence and um yeah and also do because yeah that book was pretty heavy i remember reading it when i was um recovering from eating disorders which was actually harder for me than recovering from alcoholism and it was a little heavy for me like i was like ooh. I don't know if I'm ready yet. Exactly. And sometimes, yeah, so I think it went back on my shelf for a couple of years and then I picked it up again and was like, oh, this is great. This is golden. I'm going to give another book recommendation, but also, uh, you know, maybe just ask around for your experts that you're working with. And it's called A Liberated Mind. And uh, it is the acceptance and commitment therapy uh, from a PhD uh, recovering person as well as somebody who lived with anxiety and depression. And uh, the, the things that are in there are pretty, um, I don't want to say controversial because I don't think they are, but they're, I mean, especially uh, Dan with your, with your mind, the, what you're able to kind of isolate is very, very interesting. And I use a lot of those practices, the acceptance and commitment therapy in my practice. And the goal is to have psychological flexibility around our trauma, around everything. And I think that that's really important when we're looking at healing trauma, which of course I bring up in the in the context of that codependency is born out of trauma. So just, you know, as a clarification, I appreciate you bringing that up, but I, I am very big on not wanting anybody to leave without having context. The reason that that isolated for me uh, is, is because some states in general are really bad when it comes to diagnostics in terms mm -hmm. of neurodivergence and it, within that HMO specifically, I uh, Kaiser individually, and I've worked with them on a pretty extensive level. Their testing for neurodivergence is not specific to neurodivergence, and I've been told by their doctors that it's they do it as a way to kind of weed people out. So uh, more often than not, I think it's only a ten percent of people pass that they actually show that they're ADHD without getting secondary, and even when they are, they individuals don't work with psychiatrists they only work with them for the purposes of medication everything else goes down to social workers that aren't prepared to handle conversations relating to adhd neurodivergence or any uh, subconditions so when that struck it was i don't want to say a red flag but it stuck out to me because so often there is a disparity it, it's that it's the slapstick dei ideology where they're they're putting it on there just to say their name was attached to it mm. you know I, I think you are opening it up another conversation that should be had in an adhd scope is diagnostic is troubling in most places and uh you know there is a huge skew uh against um 
or lack of diagnosis in women, especially. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, you know, that's why having these rooms is so powerful because we can and, and we can empower each other to demand the help that we deserve. Yes, I love that. It's beautiful. Um, Darcy was asking, the concept of neurodiverse is new to me. Is GAD considered neurodiverse? Great question. Um, gosh, uh, neurodiverse is a way to, so when my son was first diagnosed, they, we used a term called neurotypical because that sounded a lot nicer than normal. Um, you know, they, they, cause you know, we were saying that, uh, it's a, you know, that my son wasn't normal because he had a neurodiverse brain. I don't, I am not qualified to answer that question. I think there's a lot of overlap, um, with neurodiverse and generalized anxiety disorder. I can tell you that there has been a recent study where uh, if you were partnered with a narcissist, I mean, we're talking clinical one percenter, that your brain could be traumatized to match an ADHD brain. Therefore, it was acting like an ADHD brain. But we do not have enough, in my opinion, brain specs. Um, being involved with brain spec imagery 16 years ago when my son was diagnosed, I can just tell you we're the, in the infancy of what that really means. Um, and so uh, I, I absolutely believe in the working uh, definition of neurodiverse, your brain doesn't work like a neurotypical brain, then it would qualify. But I'm, I'm not a medical professional, nor am I uh, uh, qualified to say that. But for me, I, I have a neurodiverse brain. And I also have, uh, G, you know, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. I don't, I don't qualify for bipolar, but I've been tested. I have been uh, diagnosed with ADHD adjacent, you know, right on the cusp. And, uh, you know, it, this is something that I had to make a very personal decision about when I received my son's diagnosis because autism or neurodiverse brain and his type of quote autism had a lot of things attached to it that we could help. Um, but because he got that diagnosis, they were saying, well, no, there's nothing you could do because autism is forever. And so I've seen the field up close change over the years. And uh, the DSM-5 that I think Catherine might have brought up in this room or the room before is absolutely uh, controversial for many people. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I helped or I added more complexity to it, but I do think it's an incredibly complex issue. Yeah, so, yeah, with neurodiversity, it is, you know, if that's a new term for you, which I know for me, that was like, oh my gosh, what does that mean? It's describing the spectrums of autism and ADHD. And again, like Christina said, there are seven different types, according to Dr. Amen, who I follow. He is very controversial in the medical world. But um, he really, really describes a lot of things. And I've learned so much from him in his clinics. And um, so neurodiverse is like the description of autism, ADHD. It kind of falls under the same umbrella. And then there's the spectrum. You know, there's the spectrum. And so some people can show up with autism like, you know, um, the stereotypical rain man. Other people show up as autism being very incredibly intelligent and functional, mm -hmm. but maybe internally struggling. Same as ADHD. Some of us are off the charts, wah, all over the place. And some of us, you know, have some things. And then with generalized anxiety disorder, and again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a clinical worker. However, you know, it's one of those both and like anxiety, general anxiety disorder is not exclusive to ADHD or autism. However, it's a, a symptom that is very common. So it's kind of like if I forget where I put my keys, I might not be ADHD. However, that's a very common trait of ADHD people. I'll be looking for my keys while they're in my hands. So it's like generalized anxiety disorder isn't necessarily exclusive to neurodiverse people, but it's definitely a common symptom. So really quick, um, just for perspective, uh, General anxiety disorder is considered under the umbrella, according to the Americans with Disability Act. 
So just throwing that out there for context, um, I would also mention that the term neurodivergent is controversial in and of itself because of the fact that labeling is the enemy of progress. So it, just putting that out there, I, I'm, I could talk about this all days, but I'm going to shut up out of respect for Christina and Val. I love sure. you, Dan. We have it. We each have our experiences with labels and, and yeah, that is a whole nother room for sure. We can all duke it out. Be like labels. Oh, go ahead, lady. Lady Michelle. Uh, Michelle. Hi. Hi Michelle. Um, I just wanted to say that it's I'm touching with the ADHD and you had mentioned controversial a little bit, but I love, um, I'm from Vancouver and I do a lot of work with the Vancouver East side and with the uh, Dr. Gabor Mate. Yes. So he's got scattered minds, the attention mm -hmm. deficit disorder, as well as um, when the body says no. So the hidden stress is behind that. Right. And a lot of those things are, what you find now and it is that you're right like the neurodiverse with drug addiction and mental illness and when you have that cultivating together it's it's good that for people to be able to reach out and to have that and to look at those chronic conditions that have when you have when you were mentioning the 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 word that you used was the deterioration of the body and i mean myself i went from thinking i was fine to having multiple sclerosis and I mean, other autoimmune um, conditions that looking at my brain scans over the period of time that I went from making six figures to homelessness to, uh, to coming back. And they can see that how that, those stressors of everything that was happening increased the size of this mass that was on my brain and then adding more lesions and stuff. And you know what? When you start to take care of yourself and those mental, the mental fog goes away and when you can start to get control of that, that ADHD and, and everything that's there, it is the stressors on your body that will affect you 100%. So that's me personally. And then I love what uh, Gabor is doing. So it's fantastic. And if you can catch his, uh, do a screening of his film or anything, it's great. So um, yeah, just to throw some books out there for everybody. I'm Michelle Complete. Oh, thank you. And I believe his work is phenomenal. And uh, I think it's going to transform a lot of the way we're thinking. Um, and I don't, I'm not an expert. I've seen the film. I, st I study his content. Um, I feel very strongly that he is correct. Um, but I also uh, know, you know, like what my lane is. And so I love that you were so willing to share what your personal experience is with all of this. And, and I think that, um, that I've, I've known many, many people who used codependency as their route to healing, you know, or recovering from it, who also have multiple autoimmunes. And so I do think it's incredibly serious, um, much more serious than just don't be a pushover. And um, I just thank you for bringing him up. Yeah, the myth of having that code, I, I did, I healed with codependency. <laughs> so that's why I was just like, yes, I love this room. I'm so grateful to you guys. Val, Christina, everybody, uh, Catherine speaking, and of course, uh, Dan, it was fantastic. And for sure, catch his new book, because I read it, and it's amazing. The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture, because it is the outside world. So thank you guys so much for the room. We're looking forward to more. Whoop, whoop. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, beautiful, beautiful. Tons of great resources out here today. And I want to hop on over to, um, I'm probably going to say your not, name wrong. I'm so sorry. Raj Kumar, if you're able to speak, I don't see your mic showing up. So you might need to click up on leave quietly and then come back in. The app has been a little bit glitchy. So I'm not sure if you're able. To, oh, Sally, were you wanting to speak as well? No. Oh, okay. All right, Raj um, Kumar. There you are. We can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the uh, little bit of disruption. Thank you, well for giving the opportunity to speak. I'm Raj Kumar, and I'm from India. I feel like I have certain things specifically to share on a spontaneous note. Basically, I actually uh, coping up very much effectively on understanding how ADHD and codependency has to affect my life in an uh, enorm enormous manner. Let's, uh, in an in an instance that. Uh, if I'm being the puppet, uh, ADHD is a very ex explicit symptom, explicit condition. But deep down, 
the doer is actually the core dependency routines factors or even let's say a parasitic nature why i stress the word called parasitic means it cannot dip, it can act upon when it find a suitable host let's say i am being the host means it it has a lot of tendencies to take over my conscious rational thinking and most likely i was entirely impulsive why i'm saying all these things is that i was entirely highly rogue manipulative malicious because i never knew that these were coming as to me as instincts impulses it took me a hard time to understand which is which what is what and how can i actually differentiate this codependent routines or tendencies with respect to my actual trauma i can honestly say that after so much of introspection and a certain level of uh, awareness and mindfulness it has nothing to do with this so for the past 8 months since my club was in inception i started to train my mind in such a way that i actually allowed this temp- tendencies to take me over so i was able to re- see my actual ugliest nature the reason is that when i find these things happening to my four friend i started to process it because i cannot live a life with that i cannot run away with that because it's in me but if i had to get out of my system all i simply has to see it if my if my mind is entirely primed with this i can have the ability to see most likely since my mind was noisy i couldn't see it clear because it was entirely uh, a straight line a streamlined thinking not a sophisticated or even a, a multifaceted thinking so i'm just putting a little bit of uh, keywords that uh, i need to see the trauma i need to see this tendencies i need to understand the duration and time interval how far how recurrent these tendencies has been happening so let's say to give all these things if you ask me to take a stable decision i can only <laughs> know to run i don't know how to take responsibility and to take a clear decision i was able to say rant uh, even uh, or even to uh, false accusations accusation or blame others because i don't want to take the guilt i don't want to take the shame i only know how to bypass it because it was passed as to me as genes as routines but what made me a difference is that i couldn't be social i couldn't be a proper functional effective professional or even a person all i carried was simply pain this malicious stuff but nothing was authentic so this is where i felt a change i started to vocalize i started to resonate with my principles with others so that i could be myself few things which i learned is that there is no such thing called safe space only i have to take that strong notion to create a safe space so what i did is that to i started to do the opposite of what these core dep- dependencies means to me if i if i am supposed to tell a lie means i'll stay the honesty despite the f- factors or even the consequences involved because over the time i gained its control towards myself i started to become responsive instead of being reactive to i don't want to stake your time because it's you are putting your time and energy these are manipulative malicious for a reason they tend to de- uh, destroy they tend to get their own uh, revoked when they don't find the host or when they find the host most immune if i'm immune i'm knowing these tendencies if i'm speaking about me that means it gives me the courage or even the advantage that i have the control rather than it's having the control over me so the choice of words the choice of language the fabrication the way i portray myself gave me a little bit of advantage because if i feel this impulse is coming up to me i'll tend to uh, divert myself so ultimately the way i started to f- find manipulation or is find peaceful is by seeing it understanding it giving the time to process so that they will start to vanish from my system because i'm just communicating with my nervous system the more i get connected with myself the less i detach from these things so that it is not a problem uh, i stopped focusing on my emotional volcanoes whether i started to look at the thoughts which are leading to these emotional volcanoes so simply if the picture is clear this will come to our light since so much is happening we don't know where to start with i just want to rest my plane that just be honest 
just be authentic and you'll find a way out because definitely my identity has been brutally damaged so i'm trying to rebuild my own these thing, these identities never had an identity they just, they just simply latch on my own and they give a lot of mental delusions they cannot survive so you are the host you know what to do be strong and just be clear thank you oh thank you thank Woo-hoo. you There's so much beauty in what you shared and uh i appreciate that you've found a way out there's uh i, I think our processes uh are very similar um and and i do think that it is important to recognize our role in it and what i loved most about what you said which is one of the solutions is starting to find people uh and sharing our truth um to begin to figure out who we are um and what it is we really want and uh i know that the very first room i ever did about codependency and setting healthy boundaries was the first step was self awareness and self love and so uh that's kind of one of those moments um that's that inside out outside in process where uh we we need to figure out from an individual basis what works for us and we spent a lot of time in trauma work which i think is incredibly important but getting back to codependency um there is a solution and there is freedom from it so i'm so glad that you've found something that works so well for you thanks for sharing your experience woo i love that there is a solution there is a solution i hope that everyone has walked away with that beautiful insight today there's hope there's community there's support there's a solution christina thank you so much for giving and being so generous with your time all of your beautiful experience, um, your energy, your space, and everyone who has been here shoulder to shoulder with us throughout the day, and anyone who has been here, you know, holding space, sharing the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you guys. Christina, what do you have coming up? Um, Of course. I am just so honored that you were here and that you showed up. And what do you have coming up? I know you said that you have the um, the quiz that everyone can go on to. Yeah, on my personal website, um, there's the free program uh, that really just gives you basics and foundations and lots of really good examples for anybody who might have felt like they heard themselves in some of the shares or my share. Um, and that's completely available to anyone. Uh, that's on um, my website website which yeah it's still connected but next week i will be back in clubhouse starting on monday in recovered life uh you know monday we we do a breakdown breakthrough kind of sharing room uh, tuesday we do the rewire your brain room where we get into a lot of the good yummy stuff that we talked about today and then wednesday we um we do the setting healthy boundaries room so please uh come join whether you identify as recovery or not, it is a place of healing for everyone and everyone is welcome, all paths. So love to see um, see all of you um, there. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Hit that follow button for Christina. She is incredible. They do so many rooms in the recovered life. And obviously she's a very generous, beautiful soul. So um, I'm like, man, we might need to start a group just to do that, that free training she has together and go through it together because we all have our hurts, habits, and hangups that we can recover from. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm honored to be to share this space with you and so grateful for you. You guys, this has been ADHD Rise. We're talking with Christina Dennis here today, codependency. She is amazing, incredible if you missed any part of it grab the replay. Um, You can also, I put in the link um, ADHDrise.com to get in the know. There will be a couple, there will be some more events. We'll have Fridays coming up here in Clubhouse. And then there's a few other things in the works as well in different spaces and different places. So make sure you're signed up to get those notifications. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this beautiful day. Thank you, Val, for the opportunity. Thanks, Polly, Catherine, Sally, everybody who shared. I appreciate everybody's participation. Absolutely. And if somebody has questions for you, Christina, what's the best way? Is it here, Instagram, email? DM me here um, okay. or, or, you know, any of those places. But uh, I, I tend to be hanging out um, here a lot. 
and I will get to them pretty quickly. Nick shared a conversation. Lady Michelle, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Christina, again. I love you guys. And remember, this is ADHD Rise. When I rise, you rise. We rise Rise. together. (laughs) I love you guys, and I will see you very soon. Have an amazing Friday. Thank you, you, thank you. Thank you, guys. Have an amazing Bye, Sally. Have an amazing day. Love you. Uh-huh. Have a good day, Bye, Mama. everybody. <laughs> Thank Bye, you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here. And sh- carry this energy with you throughout the weekend. And know that you are in my heart and I'm carrying you as well. I love you. Bye. Bye.